Amen. Glory to God. Amen. 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 The Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, another morning, Friday morning. How's it? How's your morning going so far, Branches? Or is it way too early because it's probably dark where you're at? And whether you're for most of <laughs> Most of our branches, they're still taking the sleep out of their eyes. Or if you're Wendy and Eric, it's dark outside because it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So. Well, just get your coffees and your Bibles and let's prepare for worship. Amen. And we do pray for those areas. I know yesterday we heard that there was an earthquake Seriously, on the borders yeah, there's of some serious China. things going on right there's, now. There's uh, yeah. many, many things happening. There's uh, ice storms happening all over the place in Michigan. And uh, we just pray for people's safety. We pray, Lord, that your hand will be upon them. That in their hour of need, Lord, they would look to you. Lord, you would show up to comfort them. And to make provisions, Lord, for families. For those that are without homes right now, without power. Oh, Lord, many that are grieving lost loved ones. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your very present help in a time of need. Hearts and lives would look to you right now, Lord. They would call upon your name. Send your ministering angels. Send your people, Lord God, to minister. Whatever the needs are, Lord, you take care of those needs, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship your name this morning. Behold, the Lord is my salvation. I wrote this song. It's, it's not my words. They're words from the scriptures. So... We just thank the Lord. I can't remember where it was in. Sounds like it was from Psalms. Either Psalms Psalm. or... Some Psalms. Yeah, yeah. I'll look that up. I'm sure Richard will post it on. I'll try to look it up for mm -hmm. everybody. I have it marked in my Bible, but... Hallelujah. Worship you, Lord. Worship you, Lord. We can trust you, Lord. Just the 
draw strength from you. We will draw from the wells, wells of salvation, plural. There are many wells, hallelujah, that we drink from of the Lord. And this is why Jesus called himself in uh, living water, why he told the woman at the well that if we drink of the water that he has to offer, we will never be thirsty again. Amen. You are the Lord of our salvation. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So we praise your name. We praise your mighty name. You are worthy of our praise this morning, Father. We lift up holy hands to you, Lord. We lift up holy hands, the Lord of all creation. Fill our lives, Lord, with your sweet aroma. Oh, glory to your name.
<laughs> I know we're just Glory. doing that to be commercial. Amen. Glory to God. Glory I will Lord. praise Hallelujah. the Lord. We do praise you today, Lord. We get up on our feet and we dance Spirit, in your presence, dance. Lord. The joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> Audrey was saying, for all well, that song we were doing uh, yesterday, uh, Let Us Rejoice in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I loved what I was saying. All the dancing the ladies. She said, if you could see me, I'm dancing now. You know, that's how it's all going. Praise God. Oh, wow. The Lord gives us a new song every day. But again, and that's that's the picture that we have of worship, of, of unadulterated, of pure worship, is the story of King David. When he brought the Amen. ark into Jerusalem, look what he did. You oh, know, he was dancing. He stripped crazy, down to his skivvies. I don't. I'm not suggesting that's what we hallelujah, did. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, well, but, but he suggests he stripped down to his skivvies and he danced through the streets of Jerusalem. Amen. In so pure Lord, adoration you, of the Lord and and thankfulness and gratitude. So, uh, if you are able to worship like that, like Audra, and I know you all do, then it it just shows how. Grateful free. You are We're free. You are free in the spirit the, and how grateful you are. Take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise you. I just want to praise you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. I'm going to try to find the chords for that. Let's get on with the study. Praise God. Bless your word, Lord. Bless your word, Lord, as it goes forth. This morning, Father, as we come around the table of your word, just give us deep insights. Lord, and, and may we grow in grace and love this morning. Amen. Amen. Got my Bible. Y'all got your Bibles? Your journals, whatever you're using? Praise yes, God. I assume everybody has their Bibles. Starting a new chapter. Wow. And you have your fingers ready for the chat. I'm getting ready to put all those hearts and fires and, and emojis, all those hearts and fires and praying. I gotta get my and, drink. And just, you know, gathering together. It sounds like I'm I'm being sarcastic or mocking you. I'm not. I love it when I see that. Coffee in a bottle. That's, yeah, coffee. That's what you, what you guys were talking about yesterday. <laughs> and I blame Unique for that because she was talking about putting the kettle on and yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, she forgot about it. And then Anne says, "Ooh, coffee!" And then she's talking about taking coffee intravenously. <laughs> and uh, what a sorry lot we are in the morning. No, we're not. But I should not say. We're not. Hallelujah. That's and Melissa said we're addicted. <laughs> Melissa said you're addicted. We are. We are. <laughs> We are Melissa. I I, I, I have to acknowledge no, that. No, I can go without coffee. Oh. No. Yeah, I can. No. You can. No. No. She can't either. Don't yeah, listen I to can. her branches. No. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So, um, we're starting chapter today, chapter five of Isaiah. We're just, we are moving right Psycho. along here. We are just moving right along. Um, and now we're going to be mm. introduced to... Um, Isaiah is we've singing. talked about it. I know because I have quoted this. We talked about this, and I, it, it's funny we're going to go back to this because I remember. I remember, and I quoted this. We talked about this. These particular passages, at least Isaiah five one to uh, five, or to down to seven. This whole motif of the vineyard, we talked about it when, when Jesus spoke about the parable of mm. the wicked vine dressers in Matthew 21. And we're going to do the same here, but we're going to do it in reverse. And we're going mm -hmm. to see the Lord drew from this from this particular um, symbolism or this particular allegory. Um, it says it's a song of the yeah, vineyard, of but, the vineyard. But we can, and I'm sure it was a song, but we can look at it as a parable, as an Old Testament it's parable, in three because parts. it is. And it's in three parts. Mm -hmm. And I, the Lord drew on, on the elements in this story about vineyard. And of course, the vineyard in the Lord's story and the vineyard in this story are the same thing. And that's the important mm -hmm. thing. That's the, the jump off point. And what is that vineyard? That vineyard is Israel, the people of Israel, the chosen people. Um, and by extension, because it is a vineyard, um, the land of Israel, the, uh, the promised well, land. You know what I love is that Isaiah calls the Lord his well-beloved. I love that. 
Now let me sing to my well beloved. Well, we haven't got there yet because, because Eric hasn't read anything, so the branches are going, What is she talking about? Oh, I, they're reading their Bibles. I, I too. Don't get, no, They've already oh yeah. yeah no yeah, no, yeah. they're in the chat saying yeah. good morning to one another and they're mm -hmm. just ignoring you as usual. They are reading yes. their scriptures. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. But let's Eric, you and I are behind, so let's let's catch up here and let's read uh the fifth chapter of Isaiah from one to where's your first two? Oh, the first two. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's let's just start with the first two verses. Eric, if you will, my friend. The book of Isaiah, chapter five. Now let me sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst, and also made a winepress in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. You know what I love here? I love how he says, my beloved. Mm -hmm. I just love that. Uh, me too. Me too. You want to say something about that, honey? I just love the way Isaiah says, my well-beloved to the Lord. My beloved. So yeah, let me sing song. for my beloved a love song. My beloved. We're all looking at an echo here of, of um, the Song of Solomon. Mm. Um, it, 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 singing a song to your beloved. And it's endearing is, terms. And this is what our music industry is based upon, is writing songs of love, where you're writing these songs, the majority of them, great are love promise. songs. Thank to goodness. someone that you love, the most important person in the world. And, of course, they become multi-million dollar se sellers. Why? Because we all have that common experience. We all have that common emotion where we love, you know, there's that special someone. special Most people, yeah. And, and hopefully it's your husband and wife. But, um, again, without going into too much detail, that relationship is the most relationship the, the most deep and fulfilling relationship that we have as human beings, which is why, and God put that into us, which is uh, it, that, yes. it, that expression of for love, love for one another. And the need to give love. It comes out of mm -hmm. our, our love, our, either it's our subconscious, the love of our soul for its creator. Yes. It, if, if I could say it that way, um, that, Ultimately, our love is is to the Lord, but we are to also love our husbands and love our wives, and love our neighbors, Although, and love our neighbors as well. As ourselves. Um, but in this case, this this kind of love that we're talking about is is a romantic kind of love, very and endearing, deep. deep um, again, you've all heard the teachings on the the four different Greek meanings of love, and we only have one word in the English language that expresses all of those things, and that's love. So. Um, but it could be brotherly love, it could be romantic love, it could be... Well, um, that's a love that lays down love its of life the Lord. Uh, for, for one another. Well, it's... it's Jesus, it demonstrated that, his it, love for It us. is that, but I think with this, yeah. that, again, this is someone, this is a husband to a wife, mm -hmm. or, a, you know, a, between lovers, okay? Mm -hmm. And we know that God elsewhere, and, and we're going to find this in Isaiah 2, another metaphor that God uses as his... Uh, uh, to demonstrate his union or demonstrate his relationship with the people of God, mm. the chosen people, Jeez. is that of a husband and a wife. And we know that because that's translated into uh, our own faith and the faith of Christianity because we understand, we've had some roundtables about this, mm. but we, have, we understand that the church is the, it will be part and I'll play a large part of the bride of Christ. And we understand, mm. and I've said it many times for communion, we've said it in passing a lot of times, how um, we are ter we are waiting upon the Lord to return from making these heavenly habitations, um, yeah. for, preparing a place for us, as a Jewish bridegroom would have done preparing a place for his bride. For his bride. And... We understand this in the same terms, in the same way, that this is what we're waiting for. And when we go back, we come back as a bride, because into those heavenly habitations that the Lord even now is preparing for us. I go to prepare a place yes. for you. I mentioned that yesterday in John 14. So I think, because, and he calls it my love song concerning his vineyard. Amen. Okay. And here's where we understand 
My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. Okay, so I think what we can read into that, beloved is the children of Israel, is, is are the chosen people. Yeah, Judah. Judah, the people mm -hmm. who are chosen. And had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. Um, the vineyard could be the land of Israel and, and is... Again, these things work on, on multiple levels, and you can multiple interpretations into what exactly they, they're supposed to signify. It could mean that, but it could also mean, it could be a, a story of, it could be Jerusalem, city of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem sits on a very fertile, it doesn't sit on a fertile hill, but it sits on a hill. Um, hmm. This fertile hill, and we talked about this yesterday right. about, about the fertility of the land and how modern day of Israelis has brought it back after having uh, nearly 13, 1400 years of the land just going to seed and, and them not doing the, the Arabs and the Muslims not doing anything and reclaiming this, the, the land for the promised people as God had intended. So we can see all these images, all we can see all these things at play here, just in that one little sense. Well, Judah is likened to a vineyard that has every advantage. Again, my beloved is like yep. a vineyard. You know, it's just like a vineyard. So it refers to, yes, the people of Judah, the, the Israelites. Then, yeah. But it, it refers to the, to the actual land itself, mm -hmm. I would think. And, um, and we know this because a very fertile hill. But what did God, mm -hmm. what did God tell Moses? What is the famous or the favorite expression of the promised land? That what did God say that I will bring your people to a land flowing with wine, milk with honey. milk and honey? And of course, those that was a representation. That was a metaphor for just how rich the land mm -hmm. was, prosperous, and how prosperous it was. And so he dug it, and he cleared the stones, and he planted it with choice vines. And of course, this is the idea of how Israel was brought out of Egypt, and they brought and and as God even told them through Moses, He's the He true told them, vine He said, dresser. "You will have, you will have, you Hallelujah. will receive vineyards that you didn't plant. You will live mm -hmm. in houses you didn't build. You know, you will take these things because I am giving them to you. And once you and and of course, once Israel did after the, the con conquest of Joshua, and the tribes all received their inheritance." All of them went together to improve the land, and, and you know, they dug. They well, cleared he cleared out the, out the stones. He took everything out of the pathway that would cause any trouble, you which know, means for them to stumble or fall or the crops to fail or anything like that. But it also the stones also means the Canaanites, the people mm -hmm. who were already there. I removed the stones. I took them away. I took them out. I left you with a clean. I cleared it away, and he, as he promised, he to would grow on the fine grapes. He would. <laughs> and he planted it with choice vines. And again, here's here's another way of him. He's describing his people as choice vines. Uh, Jeremiah uses mm -hmm. that same metaphor in Jeremiah 2, for 21, when he says, Yet I planted mm -hmm. you a choice vine, holy a pure seed. How then have you de turned degenerate and become a wild vine? And again, this is, this is a, a, a theme. That we're going to we're seeing right here in Isaiah five and Jeremiah picks on it too. So God, this isn't the only place where God is telling His, his people and comparing them to a vineyard and comparing them to more than a choice vine, a choice vine. Think about a choice vine. That means it's a vine above all other branches. It's a vine. It's a vine that is favored. It is chosen. It is a chosen vine above everything else. And and God said, do. He said, did I choose you because you were more numerous than the rest of the people? You were greater than more of the people? No. I chose you because I chose you. It's, it, it's God's choice. Jacob, I have loved. Esau, I have hated. Again, that sovereignty of the Lord, sovereignty of God. He said, I made you a choice mind. I made you what you are through the covenants mm -hmm. I gave to you. And so that you would, those covenants would be a possible. witness to the world that there is a God and that he land. created heaven and earth. And this is what Paul tried, was telling the Athenians in, in Acts chapter 17. Very interesting what he says there. Um, and very, and you compare that, just a little side note, you compare that with what he talks about in front of uh, Festus and King uh, Agrippa in, in Acts 26. Um, you could almost compare those two. Okay, here's, in 17, here's Paul speaking to the Gentiles in languages and terms and, and that the Gentiles would understand. 
And in 26, even though Festus is a Roman, he's particularly talking to Agrippa, who's a Jew and was brought up in the Jewish religion and knows all these stories. He said, do you believe in the prophets, Agrippa? I know that you do. Paul actually said that to him. But speaking more of in a Jewish point of view, more of a Jewish mindset. So it's so, interesting how Paul, how that kind of reflects how Paul was called. We have this idea, and, and it's true that Peter was called to, to minister to the Jews, and there's that agreement in Acts. But Paul was not, and Paul was to go to the Gentiles, but Paul also testified before uh, his own people. And, of course, that's what eventually got him in trouble in Jerusalem because they saw him, and that's what he ended up in prison and eventual death. Anyway, what were you going to say? I don't remember now. Come on. No, I don't remember. <laughs> Come on. It's okay. Anyway, so there's there's a spiritual and a physical attribute to this story of clearing stones and choice vines. And he built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. Of course, now a watchtower is, is always, um, it's, it, it's, it's usually set in the middle of the vineyard. Mm-hmm. And it's to watch out, uh, to keep an eye on anything approaching that would, that would come and steal from destroy. and destroy. Mm-hmm. Kill, steal, and Little destroy. Foxes. Does that sound familiar? And it's on the lookout for those that would come to kill, steal, and destroy. Little foxes into the vineyard um, spoil the vine and that's it said in the midst and you had a mm-hmm. wine vat in it so in this wine vat this is uh, there is the suggestion that God is expecting a return mm-hmm. he's expecting yep. that uh, he's and again this is his conditional covering if you do these things then I will and of course the wine that um, the blessings of the Lord will come from the fruit that is supposed to be prepared in this wine vat. And it's, he did all the work. God did all the, the work. The true vine dresser did all the, this work. Mm-hmm. So, and he plants the best, the best vines, and he's expecting a good return on it. Yeah. Amen. So, can, can you imagine if you plant the best seed and what comes out of it is like, awful <laughs> and that's like a rebellion you and, know you expect good grapes to make good wine and out of it comes rebellion and, wild grapes and, and that are, yes that's yeah. exactly what happened huh? in, in rebellion and that's again another reason why i think the lord is setting this metaphor before them if you don't understand all these things i told you about coming to, about your uh, the state of your of your of your nation, mm-hmm. um, both spiritually and naturally, in politics and in economy, and the way that your women are. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, then I'll tell you a story. And, and of course, the, the ancients were were great storytellers. They loved storytellers, and and stories were a lot more than now. Stories were used as a uh, as, as a didactic teaching, in other words, didactic just means teaching, didactic, to illustrate a point in this case. And this is why Jesus spoke in parables and why we're going to see in Isaiah later that one of his prophecy about the, the coming of the Lord Jesus is I, I will speak in parables. And we'll, we'll talk about mm-hmm. it when we get there. Here's one of those early parables. And so he's got this wine vat. He sets it all, again says, God sets it all up. He does it all. And... He looked to, to, for the for it to yield grapes, but it, it yielded only wild grapes. Or as we said earlier, in uh, he wanted it to bring forth good grapes, he expected it to bring forth good grapes. As we, and it was we said earlier in um, Jeremiah twenty one, who picked this up, I planted a choice vine, but uh, they turned degenerate and became a wild vine. Mm-hmm. Now. Here's where we see the parables, and, and it's from this image that I believe that the Lord Jesus took his parable in Matthew 21 about the wicked vine dressers. And we almost get the same idea, because the Lord said that he, um, let me go there directly. Um...
Okay, that's not what we wanted, is it? Oh, parable of the tenants. Um, here now, I wonder what that is. He starts in, in Matthew 21, verse 33, he starts this parable, and this is what we talked about in the parables. He talked about how there was a master of a house. And of course, as we discussed that, and Anne just pointed out now, there was a master of the house. This is God. Okay. God is speaking in Isaiah 5, but this is now Jesus telling a story in past tense. There was a master uh, who planted a vineyard. And of course, God is telling in Isaiah 5 that I'm that putting you in the land that flowing with milk and honey in the, in, in the um, promised land is 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 like me creating a vineyard and all these things. And we just looked at these images and Christ used these same images. He said he put a fence around it. He dug a wine press, just like here. It says he hewed out a wine vat in uh, verse 2 here of chapter 5. But G the Lord Jesus says he dug a wine press and he built a tower. Same thing as in chapter 2. He did all these things and he leased it to tenants and went into another country. Now, this is another way. He leased it to tenants. Mm -hmm. And... This is a this is one detail that we don't have. Um, we don't have in in chapter five because it, again it's it's the master it's God speaking to Israel and he said I did this I I hewed it I put the watch tower up tower up I cleared it of stones I did all these things, but he doesn't really say anything about and I put you in it. That's kind of inferred here. I put you in it. I dug it for you because mm -hmm. he, he says in verse 1, it was for you that I did these things. And so it's kind of inferred here. Uh, but Jesus kind of puts puts an interesting understanding in, it in that in his by his time, the, the Jewish nation thought it was their right. The Jewish nation thought it was their uh, their prerogative as God's favorite of God's chosen people to be in the land. Again, as I mentioned before, and they had this idea that as long as the temple stood in Jerusalem, there the nation would never fall. Judah would never fall. Israel would never fall. And they forgot, and Jesus was reminding them by the terms that he used in his parable, the land was leased to tenants. Okay, mm -hmm. and if you're a tenant, and, and those of, care. those of you who are renting, take care and we've all rented at some point, but even a mortgage, those you have to sign a rental agreement. You have to sign a tenant mm -hmm. agreement, right? Because you don't own the property, and that's what all the covenants right. of God were about. He said, when he said, "I will give you the land," again, it was conditional on that they would do all these things that the Lord that they would not abandon their worship of God. They would not commit idolatry like they were doing. Right. Um, and as long as they were faithful to God, God would be faithful to them and keep them in the land. But the minute they were started to be unfaithful, and again, the patience of God is mind-boggling because he, he, he was patient for a long time with them that they would repent and turn. But yes. they didn't. And of course, this is what Jesus was talking. He was talking about these very people, wicked vine dressers, wicked tenants <laughs> who agreed made a perhaps made a verbal agreement that they would give the master the produce of the vineyard just like it says here um as part of their tenancy a uh, ten uh, tenancy agreement that they would give him a portion and as jesus said in his story that they, that they would give them a portion of the harvest that was the deal that's that was them, them paying their rent so to speak and although he doesn't go into details in Isaiah here, he says, God says, I looked for it to yield grapes. Mm -hmm. I gave it to you. I expected it. I expected it uh, for everything that I've done with you. Yes. But you yielded only wild grapes. Mm -hmm. And the wine press here, it's, the, the wine press usually represents judgment. Well, it certainly does the, in the book of Revelation. The pressing, the wine press, you know. I will send in the wine pressers. The wine pressers. You yep. know? Moab was used as a wine presser. But but here's where there's a little... Uh, again, I, I think the Lord Jesus is providing a little more detail behind 
the, the actual spiritual judgment is coming. It's a spiritual truth that's in this particular little parable about the song of the vineyard. In that these tenants, it does it doesn't say Jesus doesn't mention anything about the harvest in his story about what kind of grapes this particular vineyard did. In any way, it's kind of like you have to really think about it. That they did bring forth a harvest, mm -hmm. and they did bring forth wild grapes, but it's more as like Jeremiah said, they became degenerate and they became a wild vine. They, they, they um, turn not turn their backs. I'm trying to forgetting the word that I'm using, but they had no intention of of uh, fulfilling their part of their agreement their their rental agreement with God for the land again they got in this mindset that they thought they owned the land and and um, again it, it's and and that gives it what happened with when John the Baptist was preaching and he said don't say to yourselves that we are sons of Abraham and that is enough mm -hmm. um, because God can create can bring up sons of Abraham stones. out of these very stones he said you're only here because he he's allowing you to be here and it's because the agreement that mm. the rental agreement that you gave but you forget you think this land belongs to you and the Lord Ungrate. as Job said the mm. Lord giveth and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord mm -hmm. hard saying but that's that's mm. true and it's very true here and true in the story that our Lord was speaking about the vineyard of his time so he doesn't mention anything about the, the 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 natural produce of the vineyard, which is the whole point. He, they did have a harvest, and it sounds like they had a rich harvest. And so the master sent, you know, again the Lord going into more details. He sent his servants to go and collect what was his. And of course, you know the story. And from then on, they beat them and they they turned them out, and then they killed the son, the an heir who came. And what was their motivation for doing that? If you remember, their son, their motivation was here comes the son. He's the heir. So if we kill him, the vineyard will become ours. Right. How foolish to think that. If we kill him, the vineyard <laughs> will become ours. Now, <laughs> nowhere in the story of the Passion Week do we is there any kind of a suggestion or an inference that this was a motivation of the Sanhedrin. I think it was, they just didn't realize it. This is because of this attitude of, we're not renters, we actually own this land. We're squatters. They wouldn't even have thought of themselves as squatters. They just said, God gave us the land, and it's unconditional. No, it's not un unconditional. Mm -hmm. It is conditional. Yeah. He took you out 500 years before that. He'll take you out again, 600 years. Um, and But their motivation is that, and, and I don't want to put too fine a point on here, but as a, one way you can look at this whole trial with the Lord Jesus and Sanhedrin is that's the whole motivation. This is the son. If we kill him, we'll get the vineyard. Again, mm -hmm. that would have to come we'll have to the authority. That would have to ha come to the conclusion that they actually believed what Jesus was saying that he was the son of God, and that. But they were asking him that at at the trial. Are you the son of God? Tell us in the name of the, of, of the beloved. Are you the Son of God? And Jesus says, yes. And you will see the Son of God coming with power and great great glory. And, of course, they lost their minds. But, again, it gave them an excuse to, to put the Lord Jesus to death. But I'm not... The, the Sanhedrin and the, and the Jewish leaders at the time would not have articulated it that way, that, that this is the Son, let's kill him. But Jesus was telling them their hearts in this story before he even got there. Even before they did this, even before he appeared before them, he was telling them, this is, this is why you're going to kill me. Because the, mm. the, the enemy, the devil, will, will move your hearts and move your minds to see me as a blasphemer and to kill me. And it's Standing the, in their way. The power behind the throne. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Maybe the, it, it, the devil certainly knew that. He was in that room. He was in that chamber when Jesus was there. And, mm -hmm. and he was influencing minds. And that was, he knew, he knew this was the sign. And perhaps that was, we know that was his motivation. We know it from the, the temptation in the wilderness. This is the son. If I kill him, then humanity is mine. Um, 
and and I think that's a deeper part of it. We didn't really talk about that when we did the parable, but you you can really see that. And of course, it all comes out of this particular parable. Um, and so let us now uh, where she makes three and three down to seven. Okay, let's let's do three to seven. Let's finish the vineyard today. Mm-hmm. Eric, if you will, verse 3 to 7. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds, that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the houses of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. Okay, so as Anne said, this whole idea of the wine press being a symbol for judgment, God is now going to tell them. So in case they miss the point about the whole symbolism of the vineyard, yep. in case he's now going to kind of get to the nitty gritty, he's going to come right down to the nub of it. And he says, you people of Jerusalem, you, you who live in Jerusalem and think that because you live in Jerusalem, you are safe from mm -hmm. anything that happened mm -hmm. and that nothing will be taken away from you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to your people. You know, I pointed out to you uh, all all the markers, all the the signs that are there about the decline of your civilization, mm -hmm. decline of your nation because of your idolatry, because you've turned your back on me. And we went through that in great detail in the first four chapters. We said now he says, "Oh, what happens of Jerusalem and the men of Judah?" Okay, so that's the whole kingdom. Mm -hmm. Just so. All so that so they don't get <coughs> the all idea that it's just the city of Jerusalem. All this it's all of it. And Jerusalem and Judah are always tied together. They're always usually mentioned together. In fact, that Jerusalem was in Judah. <clears throat> he says now, mm. it, it, it's it's almost like he goes back to, uh, he reiterates what he says in chapter 1. Come, let us reason together. And we talked about how not just reason together. He says, now I am going to set you straight. Now I'm going to correct you. Mm -hmm. He said, judge between me and my vineyard. He says, my vineyard. So that's ownership. That's um, love. He loved my vineyard. Judge his between me and my love Amen. for Amen. his people. And hmm. again, I think this particular, this one line, judge between me and my vineyard, is... Oh, that's is an echo vineyard. from the past. And what I mean by that is my vineyard. when Elijah was coming against the prophets of Baal, oh, and of course Elijah was before this time, so when Elijah was coming before the prophets of Baal, mm. what did he say oh, to the people Lord. of Israel then? How long will you limp between two opinions? If the Lord your if Baal is God, then worship him. But if the Lord your God, if the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is God, then worship him. And you will worship the God that, dis that demonstrates, that proves that he is God. And of course, when the fire did come down, that's exactly how the people of Israel responded. Mm -hmm. The Lord our God is God. Okay, and, that, and that's why they responded the way they did. This is the same idea. Judge between me and my vineyard. Mm -hmm. How long will you limp between two opinions? Isn't that... And, and that's very much our world Double today. Double-mindedness. That's very much our world today. People who, you know, you, you talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. I know because I was like this before I came to, before the Lord intervened and I came to, to faith in Christ to see who he really was. The world limps between two opinions. Is Jesus Lord? Is Jesus not Lord? Well, it, it suggests double-mindedness too. And God said, you know, don't expect anything. 
from me if you're going to be double-minded. Yeah. Well, double. And James says, yeah, yeah a double-minded man is is unstable, unwor- unstable in all, in all that he does, and we cannot He's capable expect of, of walking away this way or that way, and He's cannot not expect to receive anything from God or devoted in His love to yeah, God. Yeah, exactly. Good. Hun. That's good. Yeah. You know, like, yep. Yep. And that's the same idea. This is this this theme going on. We as human beings are are so wishy-washy. We're double-minded about a lot of things. We're double-minded and. Uh, Again, and the world is is double my how long we would limp between again limp between these two opinions. It, either Jesus is Lord or He's not. How easily the world influences us sometimes, right? Yeah. So he's saying he's saying to Israel here, okay, look at yourself, look at your history, look where you've come from and where you are now, and judge who was responsible for that. Who did that? Was that you, or was that me? Are you my vineyard or are you are your own vineyard? Judge between mm. me and my vineyard. What more was there to do in my vineyard? This is what Anne said earlier. Right. God was saying, I did everything for you. I did everything he for you. He took pride and he loved his people, his possessions. Exactly. What more was there to do yeah. for my vineyard? It's, what it's have like, I not done it for a few you? Times. What have I not done for you? My vineyard. And of course their history yeah. showed that you know, and God had done everything for them. By yes, rights, he did. by the historical currents and 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 um, you know earthquakes of history and the movements of people and right, that the nation shouldn't have survived. It was a very weak nation, but uh, they and particularly that part of the world, which where Israel is, is a nexus between Europe and Asia. This is where the continents and the peoples meet and clash. That's why. That's why Armageddon in the, the Valley of Megiddo, that's why it's used as a metaphor where the nations meet, the Valley of Decision, as we talked about yesterday. Because yeah. Israel is right square in the middle. It's where all the conquering armies meet. You know, And that's, a lot of that has to, and we get a lot of that symbology in Daniel when he talks about the kings of the north coming against the kings of the mm-hmm. south. Finds, you can, I think this is in Daniel 10. But, um, but he said, I've, I've done everything for you. And again, he reiterates this. I looked for grapes. I looked for good fruit. Mm-hmm. And all you did was yield bad fruit. There was great expectation there. Great. I planted you in the land. I did everything I cultivated. I, you know, it's like that, that little hopes. story that Jesus told <laughs> about the one, the, 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 or the, the vine that, that wasn't producing fruit, the olives that weren't producing fruit, or a mm-hmm. fig tree that wasn't producing fruit. And the owner said to the gardener, just, no, cut it down. And the gardener says, well, let me, let me have one more season with it. And I'll, I'll cut it, I'll dig around it, and I'll put fertilizer on it. And he said, if it doesn't come through with fruit, then you can cut it down. You know, it just shows the patience and long-suffering of God. And, and everything that he's willing to do to make sure that he gets that proper um, harvest. Mm-hmm. The harvest of souls, so to speak. He 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 gets uh, the souls that he has made return to him with the righteousness of Christ upon him. He will do everything that he possibly can to save our souls, and he did by giving his son. And and in a relationship, it's always two sides to a story, right? Mm-hmm. There's always there's never just one person who's failed. It's, it's two people failing in different areas. But in this situation, God never fails. Mm-hmm. It had to be them because he did everything he could. And again, that's part of the conditional part of this, this so arrangement. So we know, yeah. God said, I kept my part of the bargain. That's right. What have you done? That's right. And so and I'll tell, and he said, I've, I've just spent four chapters telling you what you've done. And it comes down, it comes down to... Your idolatry, which is caused by your pride, which is ultimately caused by what? By sin. Mm-hmm. And sin, and, and, and because you're sinful, and you will not repent of your sins, and you turn your faces away from the only yeah. one who can help you and heal you. Um, yeah. You become it's wild grapes. People. You become bad mm-hmm. trees who produce bad fruit. And so what am I going to do? Now, he, again, and this is, his, this is his role as the owner of the vineyard. These people think, they, these are the tenants. They think they own the vineyard. And God says, you don't own the vineyard. I'm the owner. 
and I did everything, and I planted you there. The only reason you were there is because of me. And now he's going to say, everything that I've done for you, I am going to take away. You know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So what's what does he say? I'll tell you what I'm going to do to he my says, vineyard. let me tell you. I'll tell you what I'm going to do to the land. I'll tell you what I'm going to do to the people. I'm going to you remove his hedge. What sit is that? right there and you listen. Exactly. And I'm going to remove his hedge. What does that mean? <laughs> Protection. Yes, I'm going to remove my hand of protection from you. Mm, my spirit, I'm going my to, presence. Yep. I'm going to give you my blessings, up to your enemies. Everything. And and this is all this prosperity you guys have been enjoying. Mm -hmm. It's gone. You know, and 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 people will come and 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 they'll 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 come and kill you and destroy you. They'll make slaves out of you. They'll destroy your cities because my protection is not there. Um, he definitely wasn't asking for permission. He says, I'm nope. going to tell you. You sit down. <laughs> yeah. It's like when our children, they know they're in trouble, right? We walk in the room, sit down. <laughs> yeah. It shall be devoured. Now, now a hedge is a living thing. You know, it's a, it's a plant. Okay. So you can either burn it or you can chop it down. Or it, it's very easy. He, it's kind of too sighty. You know, you should have, I think God is kind of saying, down. you know, in the natural, a hedge really isn't much of an obstacle to an invading army. He said, but I put my hedge of protection around you. Mm -hmm. Job mentions this, the hedge of protection that we should, I pray every night for a hedge of protection around our house in Anna, mm -hmm. that God puts his hedge of protection around us. Um, in the natural, a hedge is probably not much much of a disruption. If they, and he said, if you'd really seen you know how you were being protected. You wouldn't have treated me like this. You would, you would have, you would have given me my due. You would have given me the fruits in season. Um, I'll break down the wall. Why have you broken down her hedges, so that all who pass by, the way pluck her fruit? <laughs> I like that. That's Psalm, what, Psalm 80, 80, 12, 80 verse, verse 12. 12. Pluck her fruit. When the hedge they comes steal. down, then the fruit, this the fruit thief that you won't, in. this this fruit that you won't give to me will now be taken by your the enemies. The thief comes in, yeah. You know, because it's not it's not the fruit I wanted. It was your obedience. Mm -hmm. It's your obedience in creating that fruit and giving it to me as I told you to. I can always make more fruit. He's God, <laughs> but he said, mm -hmm. but now I'm going to. I'm just going to give it to somebody else. You know. Mm -hmm. um, I will break down the wall, it shall be trampled. I will make it a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed. Remember how at the beginning of this chapter he said, I cleared up the stones. I cleared up the it won't it won't be pruned or hoed. That means that occupying in something I think it means occupying powers will come and your enemies will come and occupy you. And I won't I won't move them out. Hmm. They'll come and take what they want, and of course we'll see that in the the, the lives and reigns of later kings, particularly um um, Hezekiah, when the envoys from Babylon come, and um, mm -hmm. Isaiah, I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah, Isaiah comes and says to, and, and, and Hezekiah shows them everything. He shows the treasuries, he shows all the gold in the temple. And he yeah, it was Isaiah. Everything. And Isaiah says, who are those men? They're from Babylon. What would you do? He said, well, let's show them around and show them all these things. And he said, that foolish. was stupid. <laughs> that was foolish. Okay. Hezekiah, because of that, the Lord is going to break down the hedge and take all those things, and Babylon did, and eventually took all the people, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and God is true to his word here, he, and he will do this, um, this breaking down of the wall, and it shall be trampled down, this is the destruction of Jerusalem and the, and the conquest by the Babylonians in 586. It will become a waste, and it shall not be pruned or hoed, briars and thorns shall grow up. We know that because of Nehemiah, in the first chapter of Nehemiah, how people from Jerusalem come to Nehemiah is the cupbearer for Artaxerxes in Persia. And this is this is after the Babylonians have been overthrown by the Medo-Persians, by Cyrus. And they're still, you know, he's still, the, the majority of, of, of the Jewish exiles remained in Mesopotamia, in Persia, became part of Persian. And Nehemiah was one of them. And he became the cupbearer. Thorns and, and briars are like, the curse. Well, of Adam was the cursed, symbol. right? With thorns, thorns and, and briars. briars. With thorns. But 
and this is his idea. And what, and what did they tell him? He said, what news from mm-hmm. Jerusalem? And he said this very, the walls are tumbled down. The, the fields are full of briars and thorns. There's some farming going on, but mm-hmm. not enough. And, of course, Nehemiah was torn to the heart. And the idea of getting the king to send him back so he could rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. I will also command the clouds and that they rain and no more upon it. And, of course, we see Elijah had that same ability. Uh, There was famine in Israel, the kingdom of Israel, for three and a half years when Ahab and Jezebel ruled there. And, again, this is this idea of, we talked about this, the judgment that that God uses, I think it was the four things, then judgment, war, pestilence, um, famine. famine, and natural disasters. And he had to use one or the other or a combination thereof. And in this case, a natural disaster. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, because with no rain, the crops will all die. And when all the crops all die, it'll bring the other one. It'll bring famine. And, of course, God's saying, and I'm also bringing war to your gates. Your, your walls will be torn down. Jesus said the very same thing in Luke 19 outside the walls of Jerusalem. But that's why he wept. And he said, you will yeah. see... You will see ramparts and enemies at your walls coming out and, and to come in to the city and destroy the city Amen. And, and block by block. And why? Because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. Amen. Here's another visitation by God that they didn't recognize. No, Israel was very blind. That was Paul's argument in 9, 10, 11. They were very blind to their visitations whenever God came to them. These warnings, they, they mm-hmm. just didn't, they didn't heed. They didn't need them. They put their, their own. trust in chariots and horses and, horses. and the goods and the riches and denied the Lord. And and mm. in verse 7, he ties it all up of what we already understand. But in case they miss the point, he's saying, okay, now he tells them, here's what the vineyard in mm. my song means. Uh, and it says, the Lord of hosts says this. And this is coming from God directly, a direct revelation. The, the vineyard is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant Mm -hmm. planting. Mm -hmm. And he looked for justice. Again, he came to look for grapes, but he got wild grapes. But instead, he beheld bloodshed. This is what mine says. I don't know what yours says. Uh, Oppression. Oppression. Um, For righteousness, but behold, a cry cry for help. And I have an outcry. So again, we talked about how there was a lack of justice in the land at this time. And God is just reiterating it here. And he said, in case they missed all of this, this is my point. This is where you're at. No justice, no mercy, no true religion being practiced. Mm. You, are, you are a beloved vineyard, and now you become wild grapes. And Good for nothing. fruitless branches mm-hmm. Good for nothing. that are gathered up and, and thrown into the fire because they don't produce mm-hmm. fruit. You become bad trees. My my intention was I planted you in this vineyard that I created, which is the nation of Israel, which is Judea, Judah, and Israel, Canaan, the land of Canaan, the land of promise, of milk and honey. I planted you there. I gave you every opportunity to become good fruits, good trees, and you became bad trees producing bad fruit because, as Jesus says, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. That's right. And neither can a good tree produce bad fruit. Good for nothing except to be tossed in the fire. Good for nothing to be tossed in the fire. And that's Mm -hmm. exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for Mm -hmm. what this image and this metaphor, this allegory of the vineyard teaches us, Lord. There's there's so much here, Father, but we, we understand that your vineyard, your beloved vineyard, is the nation of Israel, Lord. And we know, Father, as... The younger brother has the wild olive shoots that are that are grafted onto the natural branch, Lord. We are so to take warning here, because as Paul said, if you did not have mercy upon the natural branch and you cut it off, then so well, what hope do we have, Lord God? We are no longer, and we you teach us not to make that same mistake that they did, that we are the sons of Abraham and therefore... Mm. Uh, we are we are the beloved we are which we are but lord we also know father that if we do not if we do not do these things lord in a way father that maybe even these these bodies that we inhabit are just rentals and when they're in agreement with you you put your soul in us lord god and they become us we become these personalities lord but 
Father, you you call us to live righteous lives. You 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 clear our yes, the Lord. lives of our vineyards for us. Hallelujah. You 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 take away the stones, Lord God. And when Amen. we're like like Israel, like Judah, Lord, when we are in you know, ungrateful, when we do it's not show hands. good fruit, Lord God, you will say, "Depart from me, I never knew you, Lord." Heaven forbid for any of us. And Lord, it's a hard lesson that Israel had to learn yes, over Lord. and over and over again, Father. But I pray, Lord, that our trust and faith is in you, Lord. Mm -hmm. That we will give you the due fruits in season. We will give you what is owed to you, Lord God. Out of gratitude, oh, out of out of desire to please our Father and to be obedient to what you have commanded us to do, Lord. We thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for all the dear branches, Lord, Hallelujah. who have come here. These, these are these are fruitful branches, Lord, and I pray that you will look upon them. And you will bless them mightily, Lord. They're going in and they're coming out, Father. For they produce much fruit in your name, Lord God, because they love you Amen. with an undying love. And their desire, Father, is to see you as you are. Their desire, Father, is to see your coming. And even so, come, Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you. For Amen. all of these things and what your word teaches us and the, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit leading Amen. and guiding Amen. us into all truth. We thank you, Father, Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at the end of another Have week. A blessed day. Uh, tomorrow is, is some sort of living stones. I always say that every Friday. Cause I know, because you never know. I we, never, we know. Never, we never know. We never know. But whatever, whatever but, the Lord wants to do. Mm -hmm. But we all know. Exactly. We all know that we're meeting on Sunday night, as we always do for communion. Thank the Lord for a good connection. Yep, we had great Praise one last God. week. We we'll just thank the Lord for for your hand moving Amen. in that area. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, I'll be blessed. We are blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So hopefully we shall see you tomorrow afternoon and Sunday night for communion. Amen. Love you all. May the Lord You're richly in my bless you all. Every day. You're Wait a minute. In my Are you suggesting they're not in my prayers? Did you hear that? She said they're in my prayers. <clears throat> Shouldn't she have said they're in our prayers? You're, you're in our prayers? Shouldn't she have said that? Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>